Okay, uh, welcome everyone to my talk about exploiting directory permissions on macOS. My name is uh, Chaba Fitzl, and I'm working for Offensive Security. So just a briefly about uh, myself. Right now, I'm a content developer at Offensive Security. I uh, used to be a red and blue teamer before that uh, for about eight years, and recently I started to do uh, Mac OS research, exploitation. Uh, I have a wife, two kids. I love hiking, uh, especially in the Alps, and I love to do yoga. So what I will talk about today, <coughs> uh, briefly, first I will discuss the Mac OS file system permissions, uh, the entire model. Um, then we will talk about how to find bugs. Then I will talk about all the bugs. And lastly, how we can prevent uh, these attacks. I will start with uh, going over the macOS file system permission model, um, which we need to understand uh, in order to exploit all these uh, permission is issues. Now, macOS is based on a BSD, so on a, on a very base case, it follows the POSIX file permission model. Um, if you are familiar with any Nix-based system, uh, essentially this is what you will see uh, everywhere else. So every file and directory has a set of permissions uh, on the computer, which consists of the user owner permission, then the group owner permissions, and lastly, an everyone or the word uh, permission, as it's being called. Now, each of these, uh, one by one, has a read, write, and execute uh, permission. So in overall, we have nine uh, bits, basically, that uh, controls the very basic uh, permissions. Now, <clears throat> with files having read, write, execute permissions is kind of straightforward. It speaks to itself. It's like, if you have a read access to a file, you can read it. If you have write access to it, you can write to it. And if you have execute permission on the file, file then you can execute it uh, if, it's, uh, if it's an executable. Now, with directories, it's not that straightforward, I think. A read permission on a directory means that you can enumerate the directory entries. So basically, you can list what's inside the directory. A write access to the directory means that you can delete and write files uh, to the directory, regardless of the permissions of the file. And execute on a directory means that you can traverse the directory and that you can also access the file contents in that directory. If you don't have this right, you can't access any files in the, in the directory or any subdirectories. Now, this set of permission can create some corner cases, uh, which you would think that you will never face, but in reality, uh, there are. So, Let's say we if we have a directory with read access only, uh, that means that you can't access any files in that uh, directory because you don't have any execute permission. It will also involve that, although a read access would mean that you can list or enumerate entries in the directory because you don't have execute rights, you can't enumerate them uh, really. If you have only execute permissions uh, on a directory, you can't list files because you don't have read permissions. But if you know the name of the file, you can still access it. Now, imagine the following experiment. Uh, make a, any directory, create a file inside it. In this example, I create AAA and put in AAA into the file called AAA. I change the permissions of AAA to 
777, which means that I will grant read, write, execute to the user, to the group, and to everyone else. And of course, I can list the contents of uh, AAA. Now, if I change the permissions of the restricted directory to 666, which means read, write to everyone, uh, to the user, to the group, and everyone, but no execute for anyone else, I can't get the contents anymore uh, of the file. Now, interestingly, if you try to list the contents of restricted, you will not see anything, although you have read access. But again, you don't have execute. Uh, now, you can try to directly read the, the file or the file attributes. Uh, it will be denied. And uh, now you can change back the permissions of restricted granting execute to, to the user, to the group, and to everyone. And again, the file is still there. Uh, you can still see it. So <clears throat> if in case you as a user uh, don't have execute permissions on a directory, but maybe you have permissions on the file, maybe uh, you can find a way to leak that file uh, through an exploit. And we will see a case for this. Because normally, because of the directory permissions, you wouldn't be able to see or, or access that file. But in case you can leak out that file somehow to an external location, uh, you can read it contents. Uh, if you have read, write, execute and directory, it means that you can delete and create files regardless of the files, permissions or file owner, especially regarding the delete uh, one. So if you have write access to a directory and there is a file owned by root, it means that you can delete it, uh, which we will abuse in, in many cases. Now, there are so-called flag modifiers uh, for each files. There are many of those. Uh, I will not detail all of them uh, here. From an exploitation point of view, there are two important ones. There is the you change, unchange, or you immutable, uh, flag. These are really all the same. It means that no one can change the file until the flag is removed. Um, so if the file is owned by root and it has this uh, unchanged uh, flag, even if you have write access to the directory, you cannot delete this file. Uh, so it can prevent exploitation. Restricted, this is a macOS specific flag. It means that the file or the directory is protected by SIP. SIP stands for System Integrity Protection. Um, it's basically enforced by the sandbox uh, and it protects system core files and system core directories and not even root uh, has a right access to those locations. You need to have special entitlement, which obviously is only handed out to Apple binaries that can actually write uh, to these locations. Uh, you can use the ls-l capital O uh, to show these flags. Uh, if you do it on the root folder, you will see a bunch of these. Uh, you will see a bunch, bunch of restricted uh, locations, which are the, typically the system bin, uh, USR, var, uh, for the directories are all still protected. And the hidden here refers to being hidden from finder. So if you just list these in, in terminal, you will see these uh, locations. But if you go to finder, by default, you, you will not see these locations. 
you need to unhide them. Uh, there is another interesting um, bit that can <clears throat> affect our exploitation capabilities. It's the sticky bit on directories. It will mean that the file system will treat these files in a special way. So basically, if you have a file in the directory where the sticky bit is set, only the file owner, the directory owner, or root user can rename or delete uh, the file. Now, this is typically applied on the temp uh, directory, and it's for preventing users from deleting uh, each other's file. Now, you have write access to the temp directory, and if we go back to the regular POSIX model, uh, it would mean that you can delete anyone else's file uh, there, but because of the sticky bit, you cannot do that. There is another uh, uh, important thing on, on macOS. It's the access control list. It's basically uh, a more granular access control than the traditional POSIX model. Uh, it will work with creating access control entries uh, to various files or directories. And it can be really applied to uh, multiple users, multiple groups, uh, and you have more rights uh, than the basic tree uh, in the in the POSIX model for directories. It means that you will have list search, add file, add subdirectory, delete child. For file, it's read, write, execute, and append, uh, which is a fourth one. So you can be really more granular with controlling access. Uh, in my experience, I haven't really seen this uh, overly used, uh, but you might run into it. Now, there is an, uh, another thing which I think is uh, much more limiting than the uh, ACS on file, and that's the sandbox. Now, SIP, which I mentioned before, the system integrity, integrity protection is also enforced by the sandbox. And uh, a sandbox can further restrict your file access. So there are many sandbox profiles uh, on the system in these locations that you can uh, see on the screen and those can really limit you to certain locations regardless of your user so there might be a, a daemon process running as root which would mean that you can really access almost any any place uh, on the system but maybe if you have a sandbox profile limiting you to only access certain directories this will take effect and uh, and it will be more uh, restrictive. Uh, this is an example for sandbox profile. These are written in SVPL language. Uh, I will not detail that here. It's not a sandbox talk, but uh, if you open these SB files, um, I would say with, even without knowing the SVPL language, you can read through and it will be mostly self-explanatory. Uh, for example, here we have LO5 five write, and the literal means that those specific files uh, basically. So this was for the basic permission model, and then let's see how we can find uh, bugs. So uh, there are two methods, the static and the dynamic <coughs> way for identifying uh, bugs. Uh, I mostly use the static option. Now, <coughs> here we can basically look for various file system um, permission combinations, which if found <coughs> could mean that there is an exploitable scenario. So the first one is when the file owner is root, but the directory owner is different. And this is really goes together with the third one where the file owner is root, but through one of your group memberships, you have write access to that directory. This means that 
you can delete that file, uh, which is owned by, owned by root, and maybe mess around um, with that. This is what we will mostly abuse um, in the in the following cases. There is also another case when the file owner is not root, so it's owned by the user, and by the directory owner is root. Now, this could happen maybe because others have write access to that directory, uh, not just root, but also because of there is a root process touching that file, but then later change, changes the ownership of that file. And the last one is when the file owner is not root, but the group ownership is will, which is really unique to the root user. And the parent folder or directory is, uh, is not root owned. So you can, again, mess that with that file um, and maybe gain some real group ownership uh, through a bug. So it's kind of similar to the first or third one, but not targeting the, the user, but the group ownership. Now there is a dynamic method. Basically, you can monitor for very similar relationship dynamically. Uh, you can use tools like uh, FS usage or Objective-C's file monitor tool. Uh, I think you can find the same scenarios than with, with, the, with the static method, but the main benefit is that you can find cases, uh, for example, when there is a root process touching a file in a in a location that you can control, but then later it changes the ownership of the file uh, to your user, maybe an installer. Uh, this means that you cannot find it with the static method because the ownership of the file is already modified but you can find it through through dynamic monitoring. So let's see the bugs. Uh, again, the general idea here, uh, what I will mostly abuse, uh, the goal is to redirect the file operation to a location we want. And <clears throat> the typical process uh, of the exploitation is we delete the file, place a symlink or a hard link, and and wait and see what happens uh, with that symlink or hard link that we placed. There can be a couple of problems uh, with our symlink or, or hard link. So the first is, uh, although the process is running as root, because of its sandbox profile, it cannot write to a location we want. So our, our redirect will not work. The next one is maybe there is a symlink or hard link, but instead of following uh, that, it will simply overwrite uh, the file. So we can cannot do anything uh, about this. The third one is, let's say we successfully redirected the file operation. Uh, the problem is that the file uh, is most likely still owned by root, which means that we cannot modify its contents. So we need to find a way to, to control the file contents. If we cannot do that, it means that we will only have like a, an arbitrary overwrite vulnerability, but not a full-blown privilege escalation. Unfortunately, uh, we can't control the contents of the file in most cases, but we will see a few interesting scenarios where, where we can do that. And again, if we have case one or two where it's either limited by the sandbox uh, or it's not following links, then it's not really a bug, although the permissions are not uh, ideal. So how we can control the file, uh, or why it's important, uh, we need to find a way again. 
to inject some data into the files on by root. Or let's say uh, there is a file, maybe a, some configuration file for a for an AV or some security product or or, or anything else uh, which is controlling uh, the product itself. Um, if the file is in a changeable location, you can delete that file, create a new one with your custom content, and you potentially you can bypass uh, something or do something interesting uh, with the product itself. OK, so the first one <clears throat> will be the install history plist file uh, vulnerability. Uh, this was a Mac OS uh, vulnerability. So whenever anyone is installing a, an application on, on Mac OS, the, either from App Store or from a package, the system will log it to call file install history plist, which can be found in the library receipts uh, directory. Now, admin, <coughs> admin users have write access to this location, which means you can delete the file, place a sim link, and because the sim link will be followed, you will get arbitrary overwrite. Unfortunately, we can't really control the contents uh, or only in a very limited way. Uh, on the screen, you can see the, the plist file, how the uh, how this install history plist file looks like. Uh, you can see that there is a date. Uh, you can affect it, but again, it's pretty limited. Uh, there is a display name of the application um, application version, package ID, um, and so on. So you can play around with these names, but uh, you cannot really do much uh, beyond these. To trigger this, uh, once you place the same link, you can just install something maybe from the App Store. The next one is an Adobe Reader. Uh, installer vulnerability. So when you install Ad Adobe Acrobat Reader on macOS, uh, there is a file <coughs> in the temp directory uh, with that long name. And basically, prior the installation, you can create a sim link, uh, which will be followed by the installer, which means you can overwrite an arbitrary File. Unfortunately, the content of this plist is fixed, so there is nothing really you can do about it. Uh, the next mug is kind of interesting uh, because you could grant uh, permissions to plist files. So with this bug, you can grant read, write, read, write, read permissions to any plist file on the system. Uh, by abusing this uh, diagnostic message history plist file, which can be found in the library application support crash reporter uh, directory. Uh, again, this directory allows admin users to, to write. So you can delete the file, uh, place a sim link, and And it will be followed to some extent. So it will not be overwritten. Uh, so sorry, uh, the file that you are point it, pointing to, it will not be overwritten. But if that file is a plist file, uh, the process will change its permission to read, write, read, write, read, uh, because that's the ex expected uh, permission on this diagnostic messages history plist file, which means that you can grant word read access to any plist file on the system, and you can also grant group write access uh, to any plist file on the system. And you can trigger it by going to the 
privacy pane and changing the analytics and the improvement uh, configuration. Uh, the next bug, the macOS phone hover vulnerability, uh, this was a, an information leak. So the library fonts uh, directory has a group write permission set, so admin users can uh, write to these locations, uh, location and can drop any file here. I think this permission is, is not needed and I will talk about it uh, in a few minutes later, uh, why. And this is the, the directory that contains the system byte fonts. And because I have, or we have write access to these locations, I started to, to, look, on, uh, to look into it. Now, what happens when you install a font uh, on, on Mac OS? So you double click the font, uh, this is the, the screen you, you will get. Uh, you can set the install location to either computer or user. The user location will be on your in your home folder in the library fonts uh, directory and the computer location will be the library fonts uh, directory that I just spoke about. You press install font. Uh, you select the font on the validation screen, install ticked. And if you choose to install a system-wide font, then you will get an authentication prompt. Uh, this is why I said that I think having admin write access to the, uh, to the library fonts uh, location is not needed because you will be prompted for authentication anyway. So if you are authenticated, then there is really no reason uh, to have write access. And then the file will be copied. Now I started to experiment with this and what I noticed that simlinks, hardlinks don't work. Uh, they will be removed and you can't win the race condition. Also, phone hoover is pretty much restricted uh, by the sandbox. So even if it was followed, uh, I wouldn't really gain anything. Uh, the file disclosure is happening regarding of the uh, source file or uh, on, on the in installation, installation process and not the, the target. So between the steps, when you select install font and then install ticked, uh, the file is not logged uh, by the application, which means that you can replace the font with a symlink. Uh, and that will be followed during the copy. Now, what do we really gain with this? Um, because if we think about it at first, uh, there is a root process because we want to install uh, a system font. It will move a file from its orig original location with its original permissions to a place where we have already write access. Um, and again, the file permissions are remain the same. Now, at first, it doesn't look interesting at all. But if we remember the, the POSIX permissions, uh, it could actually mean an information leak. So imagine the scenario that when you uh, don't have execute permission on a specific directory, uh, but there is a file inside that place uh, where you have read uh, permissions on that on that file. So that means that, that we can leak that file through this process, which is running as root to a location, uh, library fonts in this case, uh, where we have execute permissions. So we will be able to read the contents of the file. Um, so yeah, this is how the, the exploitation work. Uh, if we check the private var on MDS UUID token ID P list, uh, this is a file where we have uh, read permissions on it, but because we don't have execute permissions on the directory, we cannot read it. Now we can use this 
font mover bug to move this file out to the library fonts and then we can uh, read it contents. So the fix by Apple was that they will actually uh, verify the, the replacement and the symlink or hard link will not be followed. The next one uh, is again a simple arbitrary file overwrite vulnerability in diagnostic messages. Uh, the reason this is more interesting because I could achieve partial uh, control of the of the content. So again, it's the usual <clears throat> story. We have write access to this directory. There are a bunch of ASL log files all of them own, own by root. We can delete it and use hard links um, instead of sim links. And what I found that you might need to reboot for the hard link to, to take effect, um, but we can still uh, overwrite an arbitrary file. Now, this is the log file. So hopefully we can control its content and Unfortunately, only partially. So ASL logs are the Apple system logs. Uh, it's a very old API. It's, uh, I think it's already deprecated or becoming deprecated. There are very few documentations uh, on that. And my problem was that <clears throat> there are multiple ASL files on the, under the log directory. Uh, and I didn't know how to end up my ASL log in this private bar log diagnostic messages. So what will make an ASL log to show up in this log and not another one? And when I started to look, to look into these uh, diagnostic messages, ASL logs, <clears throat> it, it didn't, at first it didn't seem to contain any arbitrary text field. It, it seemed to be like having predefined uh, fields with some uh, values it can take, like a dictionary. <clears throat> now, after looking uh, through the logs, I finally found one which contained an arbitrary text, and that was the card of account refresh completed. Now I started to search for this string and it led me to the calendar persistent framework. Now, when I opened the, that framework and look for this string, uh, it made a call out to the car message tracer uh, class uh, with, a, with this log message. And call message tracer was found in the calendar foundation framework. <clears throat> now, when I started to look through this uh, call message tracer uh, class, it became obvious that, OK, this is the one that is using the, the ASL API. And I started to trace the, the functions if, if I want to do like a custom message uh, into the diagnostic messages, it started to become a bit complicated um, and much time to, to reverse the entire functionality. So I decided to stop and because I already have a class, uh, this call message tracer that can uh, place a log me, uh, a log for me in, a, in this uh, ASL log with a custom message. I can just use this class and don't care about the actual underlining uh, method. So what we can do is use DLopen uh, on this calendar foundation framework to load it, uh, use the objective C runtime to locate the class uh, with the NS class from string. And once we have that, we can basically call its uh, methods and place our custom log message uh, in this ASL log. And this worked. I could place an arbitrary content in the log file. 
but unfortunately I couldn't do more. So even if I deleted this log file and um, I made my first log, uh, I, I made my log entry the first uh, in the log file, it still had some headers and some other contents which would break any any useful stuff. So it wasn't enough for code execution, but I think it's still a useful trick how to inject uh, content. Now, the next one is finally like a full-blown privilege escalation, not just arbitrary overwrite. It was in the Adobe Reader uh, installer again. Uh, the Adobe Reader used the Ac Acrobat Update Helper app. Uh, it's, it was placed in the temp uh, directory during the installation. And there were two plist files uh, inside this directory structure that later on was, were moved to the library launch daemons uh, directory. And it was in a fixed locations. Uh, but before the installing happened, the installer delete any existing files uh, in, from the temp directory uh, with these names. Uh, so what we can do is uh, basically this is a race condition because Adobe deleted the, the directory that it wanted to use and then recreated it. Now between these two, we can create our directory again before it's being created by Adobe, which means that we will be the owner of the, uh, uh, of the directory. And I found that it's very easy to win this uh, race condition. So we can pre-create our directory structure. And once the installer plays the original plist file uh, in this location, we can delete it because we own the directory and put there our own uh, plist file. And at the very end, the installer will move the plist file into the launch daemon directory. And Basically, it means that if we can move any plist file, uh, which we control to the launch daemons, uh, we basically win because upon the next reboot, uh, the uh, launch d will start uh, any process defined in this plist file as root. So the last bug I want to talk about is the was in macOS concerning the periodic scripts. Uh, macOS has a bunch of periodic maintenance scripts under the uh, etc periodic directory, and it used to have uh, a script that rebuilded the, the main pages, basically, or the, not the main pages, sorry, the, the main database and it was running as root. Now, the problem was that it got all the main page paths, parsed through all the main pages, and created a, uh, a database. Now, if we have like brew package manager being used uh, on the system, uh, the USR local share main directory is a user writable uh, location and it was parsed by a process running as root. And this is what we could uh, abuse. So what the make what is does, it will create a what is temp file uh, for the database. And we can redirect this uh, temp file with a symlink. And our target was, uh, again, launch daemons uh, folder. Where, we, where I wanted to place a plist file. But the problem was that the plist file, in order to be loaded by LaunchD, it has to be a properly formatted XML. Now, if we look on the data, on the what is database, uh, which is on the screen, it's clearly nothing to do with XML. Uh, it's basically uh, a list uh, where the first column is derived by the, from the file name uh, of the main page, 
and the second part after the dash is basically the name uh, of the main file from the name section uh, which comes from the main section of the of the main file now how do we convert this file to an xml file the first step i created my plist file which i wanted to be run or loaded and i basically replaced the the name uh, section or the, the actual name on the main page uh, to this XML. And I run the make what is tool and it was nice because this XML uh, showed up in the database. The, pro the problem was still that there were a bunch of content after that and before that. Now to solve anything comes after, we can just start uh, an XML comment and basically that will comment out all the rest of the of the file. Uh, I still needed to solve the, the beginning uh, of the file. Uh, <clears throat> you can skip this. So the file name uh, is the is the, really the first string that will be shown in the uh, in the main page database and it has to make sense in XML. Now, interestingly, the, the file name that uh, you can see on the screen with thread, uh, red is a valid file name, which is really nice because that's the uh, start of the comment in XML, so it makes sense in XML, and that's a valid file name. Uh, I had to go back to the name section because if the file name is starting as a comment, I need to close that comment before my uh, plist file or before my uh, content that I want to be loaded uh, by launch these starts, uh, which was just pretty easy adding a close comment uh, of the file. And finally, <clears throat> this is how the man database started. So we can see that there is the file name uh, at the very beginning, which is uh, a comment basically starting. And then there is a second part, which is coming from the name section. So we have a comment at the very beginning of the file. Then we have our properly formatted plist, and then we have another comment starting. So this was a perfect XML, and it was heavily loaded by uh, LaunchD. So let's uh, see this in action. How this worked. So this is the, I'm in the man page for the, the USL local chairman. And uh, this is where the sim link will be loaded. Let's go to my desktop and do run the exploit. Uh, there are two options uh, to run this. Uh, I will choose the quick one, which will place a plist file with starting terminal. So it created a file, uh, which is here. It placed the steam link. Uh, we can check that we have the sim link pointing to launch demons and we can simulate running the, the maintenance script. Now the maintenance scripts run on a weekly basis. Uh, obviously I don't want to wait a week uh, now so we can just simulate its run. And now if we check this file, we can see that we have the XML comment at the beginning. We have our 
PDist file after it, and then we commented out the uh, rest of it. And basically, we can simulate a reboot. Oops. And uh, yeah, we have a terminal popping up as root, but unfortunately, it's not always coming up properly. to the screen. But let's go to You can see that there is a terminal running as root. Uh, sometimes it doesn't show up properly, but um, you can see that if I load this P list, terminal is coming up. Uh, obviously, because this is a, a live demo, it doesn't work right. But anyway, this is how it works. Um, so lastly, how we can avoid uh, these attacks uh, with installer, regarding installers, basically, uh, if you need to use the temp directory, just use a random name that cannot be predicted. Or if you really don't want to use a random name, but a predefined name, then do these steps, create a directory, set the permissions to be owned by root only, and no one else has any right access to it, clean up the directory, and then you can start using it because then no one else can place uh, any content inside it. Uh, a move operation uh, is also safe. So if you move a file, one file to a specific location, if that place is a symlink uh, where you move that file, it will be overwritten uh, by the move operation. And in objective C, uh, if you use the write to file uh, method of various classes like an string, uh, it will not follow uh, symlinks, it will just overwrite uh, what is there. So it's like a safe function or method to use. So that was all from me. Um, thank you very much for, for listening.